Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I invite you to take your Bible and turn with us to Revelation chapter 4 as we read verses 1 through 11 as we look tonight into the throne room in heaven, the throne in heaven, where we go literally inside, as best we can, inside the throne room. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 4. Begin reading at verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to Him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, and the four and twenty elders fall down before Him that sat on the throne and worship Him, that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, we see John in chapter 4 and verse 1. He's been airlifted out of this world through a door that had been opened in the heavens. He was told that he was about to receive a revelation of things which must be hereafter. Now the Greek word there is what gives us our indication as to how we're going to approach Revelation chapter 4 and where it falls uh, into our interpretation of our key verse, Revelation 1 and 19, and it's going to set our tone of how we look at the rapture, the pre-tribulational rapture. And we could spend uh, hours, literally, on the different viewpoints uh, that people have about the rapture of the church. Pre-tribulational, post-tribulational, mid-tribulational. We believe, according to the Word of God, because we take the interpretation of Scripture to be uh, we believe the Bible to be uh, interpreted best through the literal, literal historical, grammatical uh, interpretation of the Scriptures. And when we do that, we see that uh, Revelation 4 is a transitional verse. Revelation 4 and verse 1. A transitional verse. One of the reasons why we believe that is from the Greek word metatoda, which means hereafter. When we look at Revelation 4 and verse 1, we come to understand that John was a representative man. He represents all true believers in Jesus Christ who will be taken out of the world 
at the end of the church age in the event that we refer to as the rapture. And we find this uh, described by Paul in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses uh, 13 through 18, and Paul also alludes to it in great detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So we praise the Lord for the blessed hope. That's what he calls it in his letter to Titus, Titus 2 and verse 13. Christ is coming and we are going. And as we move deeper into this chapter, we're given a glimpse as to the very throne room of God Himself. We're allowed to view some of the activities that take place in heaven before God's judgment is visited upon the world. And the scene that's described in these verses is almost beyond our comprehension. Uh, definitely cannot understand it fully because of our finite minds and our lack of imagination. But in these verses, John gives a small glimpse of what will be going on during this time. So let's go with John into the throne room of God. And we need to have this heavenly perspective in our minds for the world today. Uh, We cannot continuously try to improve the world when everything is very evident that it's continuing to get worse and worse. And we have to have the attitude that either God caused whatever it is that's happening in the world, the chaos, the confusion, the evil, or God allowed it. God causes or allows it because God is sovereign. And these are things that's happening in our world today and they're sad for us to see as a believer. But these are things that are happening in the world today and the evil and the chaos that's going to usher in God's plan. So from an earthly perspective, this world appears to be out of control. We see war, disease, uh, crime, wickedness, ungodliness. But when you understand that God is and has always been on the throne, you understand that He is in control. He's perfect. He's eternal. He has a good plan. And that plan always falls into place. Uh, I'm reminded of a Persian rug that on one side is finished. It looks great. It looks wonderful. On the back side, it's not attractive at all. It's a mess. But that side is necessary to have the finished side. What we have in the world today is necessary for God to bring this world to where He wants it and has to have it to carry out His will. Now, before we go too far, I want to look at the outline of Revelation, and maybe you can better see it this time. It was a little bit on previous videos, a little bit too small. And so, chapter 4, we are now in the things of which shall be hereafter. Chapters 4 through 19, we are given visions from heaven and earth. Partial, uh, par- partly of these verses take part in heaven, some go uh, take part in earth. And we'll, we'll discuss those when it becomes appropriate. Now we're in the throne room in heaven. And then chapter 5. And as you see, we've got a long way to go. But it's at this point also I'm going to put our prophecy timeline. Now, about a year ago, we went through Bible prophecy. Uh, this would be a good place to have that in front of you. As you can see, what we have denoted here as the rapture This is where we are. This is chapter 4 of Revelation. So the rapture of the church, we believe, takes place in chapter 4. And John is the representative man. And we are immediately ushered into the throne room of God. Now I'm going to cover chapter 4 and verse 1 more in detail at a different time. Today we're going to focus mainly on verses 2 through 11. So verse 2 through 3, we see the person on the throne. The very thing John sees is God Himself. And He's sitting on the throne in heaven. What a thrill that must have been. To go to the White House and meet a a president is an honor. To go to Buckingham Palace and meet the Queen of England would be an honor. But my friend, to go into the throne room of God and meet Him would be ecstatic. That would be... uh, incomparable to anything. 
And then John attempts to describe his encounter with the sovereign God. Notice with me in verse 2, he says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. The first thing John sees is a throne set in heaven. A throne speaks of sovereignty. It speaks of authority. And we're viewing the one who occupies the place of absolute authority over all the affairs of heaven and earth. The word set here speaks of stability. It speaks of firmness. It speaks of durability. God's throne is eternal. No foe will ever be able to force him down from the place where he rules and reigns. Never. And this world may not recognize God's authority and rule today, but He reigns nonetheless. Men do not give a second thought to the existence of God, but He notices all. He controls all, and He ultimately will judge all. Men may not give Him the time of day now, but they will face Him in His appointed time someday. Man may not bow today, to Jesus, but they will one day, Philippians 2, 9 through 11, and Romans chapter 14 and verse 12. Now, immediately we see in verse 3 that John describes him as the resplendent one. John attempts to do the impossible. He attempts to describe God. And the one on this throne is God the Father. Now, how do we know? God the Son takes the seven-sealed book out of His hand in Revelation chapter 5, verses 5-7. through seven. John describes God as being like a jasper and a, sar, a sardine stone. Some, some pronounce it sardine. Sardine is the best pronunciation for us. And the word like here lets us know that we have encountered symbolic language. Remember, Revelation is a book of symbolic language. It's a book of symbols. God is not a mineral. He is not a stone. But His appearance reminded John of these two precious stones. Now the jasper. The jasper is clear and bright. It's possible that it's the same um, in viewpoint as a diamond. A diamond is a very hard stone and it speaks of firmness. And the comparison reminds us that our God is firm and unchanging. And since we're in the context of the throne room where sovereign authority is about to be exercised, it tells us that God's laws, God Himself, they are firm. God is firm. He is unchanging. There are certain laws in nature that are firm, they're unchanging. Uh, gravity. Gravity, for instance. What goes up will come down. God has established the law of gravity. It is firm. It is unchanging. If you place water in, uh, a, in a pot on a hot stove, you turn that stove on and the heat comes, you're going to... Never expect ice because that will uh, that pot will get hot and that water will boil. God has established the law of thermodynamics. It's unchanging. And the same is true concerning God's moral law. He is unchanging. He's inflexible there as well. Men kick against the moral laws of God, but they, they call the Bible out of date. They call it irrelevant. They call it old-fashioned. They do their own thinking. They do their own thing. And, and, and they think God's going to let them slide. Well, the fact is they're sinning against a God who is firm and unchanging in His moral law. And then the sardine stone, he's, he describes Him as that. That's a blood red stone. It reminds us that while God is a God of sovereign rule and absolute authority, who holds men to a high standard of holiness, He is also God of redemption. He's a God who saved all those who will turn to Him by faith. Thank God He's a saving, holy, righteous God. And so, before we leave these two stones behind, it's worthy to note that, that the sardius and the jasper 
were the first and the last stones in the breastplate of the high priest in Exodus chapter 28. The Sardius represented the tribe of Reuben. The Jasper represented the tribe of Benjamin. Now these two stones were representative of all twelve stones and were a reminder that God always kept His people and His covenants with His people close, close to His heart. In other words, these stones were a constant reminder that God would keep His word and do everything He had promised to do. Judgment will come, but it will be carried out by the one who has walked among us. There is a human side to judgment. He will judge, but it will be tempered by His compassion and mercy. Now, not only does John note that Jesus is the resplendent one, but He's the restraining one. God's throne is uh, encompassed by an emerald rainbow. The rainbow is not like those that we have here on earth. We only see half the bow. In heaven the whole entire thing will be visible. We also know that the rainbow signals the fact that the storm has ended. We also know that the first rainbow was given to Noah as a visible sign that God would never again destroy the earth by flood. Now this rainbow in heaven is a reminder that when we arrive there, the storms will be over for the child of God. It's a reminder that while we may not understand everything that happens here, we will when we get over there. And it also reminds us that God will judge the earth and that He will do exactly what He's promised to do. He will keep His promises. He will keep His covenants with His people. So the rainbow speaks of God's mercy. And even as the wrath of God is about to fall on this doomed world, God is still moving in restraint and mercy. Now every person, under the sound of my voice, is headed uh, to, uh, to an encounter with God. You may have parked your car in a Walmart parking lot, but you are in, you're headed to an encounter with Almighty God. Uh, You may be sitting in the church pew, but you're headed straight toward God. One day we will all face Him and we will meet Him in His throne room. We will meet Him in the scenes of glory, in the halls of judgment, but we will meet Him just the same. So, God is in the throne room. Has it dawned on you that we're actually going to see Him one day? Has it become clear to you and me that we will stand in His throne room and see His face? What an amazing, amazing thought. But chapter 4 and verse 4, we see the people around the throne. Now, their association. Who are these individuals? Well, some people think that they're angels or cherubim. The word elders is most... It's notable to remember that the word elders is never used to refer to angels in the Bible. Now, others think they they represent some other group. Personally, I think they represent all the children, the redeemed children of God. Now, let's examine the evidence. They're sitting on seats. This is the same word that's translated throne in verse 2. Thus, we, we see that they are seen to be reigning with God. The saints will reign with Christ one day, according to Revelation 1 and verse 6, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, and Revelation 2 verses 26 and 27. They seem to be a representative people. Revelation 21, verses 12 through 14, the New Jerusalem is described as having 12 gates and the names on them are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's built on 12 foundations which contain the names of the 12 apostles. 12 plus 12 equals 24. Now, I believe that these 24 elders represent the redeemed people of God of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, David appointed 24 Levites to represent the entire priesthood in 1 Chronicles chapter 23 and 28. 
And when a meeting was necessary, it, it would have been impossible to gather every one of the thousands of Levites together. But when the 24 came together, they represented the entire body. Now the same is true of these elders. They represent the entirety of the redeemed saints of God. These elders represent us. And notice their activity. The Bible says they're sitting. This signifies rest. Their labors are over. They're sitting. They're at rest in the presence of God in heaven. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6 that we are seated in Jesus today. That's our positional situation. Practically, I'm still in this world. I'm living. I'm laboring. I'm longing for heaven. Positionally, I'm already seated in the heavenlies. I just want to remind you that one day this life with all its burdens, cares, worries, problems, diseases, hindrances will be behind us forever. We'll go to a new home. We're going to be there unhindered, unbothered, and we're going to be there forever. We will enter into His rest and we'll be with Him in glory. Now notice their attire. The Bible says that they are clothed in white raiment. And white garments in the Bible speaks of the righteousness of the saints according to Revelation 19 and verse 8. When God saved us, He forgave us of our sins and He cleansed us of all of our sins. And that's where we stand. The Bible says that He has declared us forgiven and righteous before God. We are justified in His eyes. That's our positional standing. Practically, we're anything but righteous at times, aren't we? We strive for that, but we have a hard time achieving holiness here on this earth. One day, this wicked flesh will drop away forever. We're going to be remade in His image, and we will be perfectly holy, righteous, just like He is. Thank God there's coming a day when we will leave sin and the appetite for sin behind forever. Well, notice their adornments. The Bible says that they have their, on their heads crowns of gold. There are two words for crowns in the New Testament. One is the word diadem. This is the word that's used to describe the many crowns Jesus will wear when He returns in power and glory to reign on the earth in Revelation 19 verse 12. This is the kingly crown, the crown of glory. So that's one crown, diadem. The next crown is Stephanos. That is the victor's crown. It speaks of the crown given to victors in athletic contest. The diadem is worn by Jesus by divine right. The Stephanos is earned by the saints. Now we're told of at least five crowns that can be won by the people of God, the saints of God. The crown of life, James chapter 1 and verse 12, also referenced in Revelation 2 and verse 10. The crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. And then the crown of glory, which is uh, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4. And then the crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19. And the, then the incorruptible crown, or the imperishable crown. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 25. Now, I wish we had time to spend and, and go all over more of these crowns. Frankly, I believe there's more crowns. These are the five crowns that God has denoted in the Word of God. Now, you don't need to worry that your service for the Lord Jesus ever goes unnoticed. He sees everything you do for His glory. He knows about every sacrifice. He sees every effort that you do. He takes note of every prayer, every witness, every secret thing you do to bring glory to His name. And He will reward you for that service one day. You may not receive recognition here, and we don't need to. We wait for His recognition. Now, notice with me in verses 5-11. through 11, of Revelation 4. We see the praise around the throne. Verses 5 and 6, you have the scene in heaven. John watches, amazing things begin to take place around the throne. Verse 5, we, he speaks of wonders, lightnings, thunderings, and voices. 
The things speak of approaching judgment. Heaven booms with the warning signs and signals that judgment is on the way. These are the same things that are seen in Exodus 19, verses 16 through 19. The heavenly noises then were a warning for the people of Israel to keep their distance from God's holy mountain. The sounds were a warning that men had better reverence God or they will face Him in judgment. Then the Bible says in verse 5 that He speaks of a witness. That is, seven lamps of fire. This is the Spirit of God in His fullness. You'll see more in detail if you would uh, reference in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. The Spirit is no longer a comforter here in the throne room as described in John chapter 14. He is now an instrument of God's judgment. He is there to witness to the righteousness of the judgments that are about to fall on the earth. Well, in verse 6, he speaks of waters. The Bible says, A sea of glass likened to crystal. This crystal sea speaks of God's judgment as being form, being form and fixed. On this earth, there's nothing more constantly changing or in motion than the ocean. And the sea is never still and it's never the same. This sea is solid and it's unmoving. Judgment is fixed and it cannot be altered. If you'll remember, there was a sea of brass called the laver outside the tent of the tabernacle. And before the priest entered the tent, they were required to wash in the labor. Now, it symbolized cleansing and forgiveness of sin. How many times have we stopped at the labor of 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 and washed our sins and our stains away? I thank God that there's a place of forgiveness and restoration in His Word. Now in heaven, there is uh, that sea of brass has become a sea of glass. There will be no more need for the saints to come to God for cleansing. We will never fail Him ever again. What a blessing. But for the lost sinner, this sea remains and it reminds us that it has become too late for repentance. Judgment is set. Judgment is fixed. And man has reached his limit with God. And God is about to pour out his wrath on this world. And what a horror awaits the earth dwellers. Verses 6 through 11, you see, there's shouts in heaven. The throne room is a place of judgment, but it's also a place of praise. There are two groups here involved in the praise of God on this occasion. Verses 6 through 9, we see the shout of the beast. Now their descriptions would be, uh, it's described as beast. It comes from the Greek word zoon, which we get our word zoo and zoology from. The word has the idea of living ones. John sees these four living ones and attempts to describe them for us. He says that they're full of eyes before and behind. It speaks of their complete intelligence. One was like a lion. That represents a wild animal life. One was like a calf. That represents domesticated animal life. One was like a man. That represents intelligent life. One was like an eagle. That represents bird life. These, these four beasts represent the entirety of God's creation gathered before Him in His throne. And they're full of eyes. That is... Uh, they're perfect in their intelligence. They have six wings. It speaks of their swiftness. They rest not. It speaks of ceaseless activity. These representatives of all creation stand in the presence of God and they lift their voices in praise to the Creator. He is the Creator and everything that was made exists for Him and for His glory. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, it says every, all things were made by Him, and by Him thing, all things consist. Verse 8, we see they have a declaration. They declare His holiness. They declare His eternal nature. They declare His sovereignty, His control over all. All of nature is involved in praising the Lord. 
the rain, the sun, the birds, the animals, everything but man exists to pray, to glorify God. Everything but man glorifies Him by doing what He formed them to do. Man was created in the image and the likeness of God. Yet God says man has failed in this area to glorify and bring glory to him, His name. Now judgment is prepared to be unleashed. Now before we leave these beasts behind, we should also note that they represent different sides of our Lord Jesus. The lion pictures Jesus as he's portrayed in the Gospel of Matthew. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And as a lion, Jesus possesses majesty, power, and authority. The calf pictures Jesus as he's portrayed in the Gospel of Mark, the suffering servant. And as a servant, Jesus demonstrated service and strength. The man pictures Jesus as he's portrayed in the Gospel of Luke. He is the Son of Man. And as the Son of Man, Jesus possesses perfect intelligence and absolute moral righteousness. The eagle pictures Jesus as he's portrayed in the Gospel of John. He is the Son of God come down from heaven. And as the Son of God, Jesus possesses majesty and transcendence. These beasts are so much like him because they are so often with him. Verses 9 through 11, we see the shout of the believers. It isn't just the four living creatures that lift their voices in praise. When the four beasts begin to praise the Lord, the 24 elders join right in. Nobody is seen forcing them to praise the Lord. When they hear their Lord exalted, they cannot help but join in. They fall down before Him and they worship Him as their Redeemer. Their praise is visible. They don't just praise the Lord in their hearts. They fall down before Him. That's what true worship will cause us to do. We will fall down before Him and we will offer visible, open, unabashed praise to the Lord. Their praise is not only visible, but their praise is valuable. They take the crowns that they've been given and they cast them at the feet of the Lord Jesus. They acknowledge that where they are, when they have, And all that they have accomplished, what they have and all they have accomplished, is a direct result of His power, His grace, His love. They owe it all to Him and they offer it to Him, everything they have. They're not concerned about their own glory. They are lost in His glory. Their praise is vocal. On top of everything else, they open their mouths and they loudly proclaim their love and adoration for the Lord. They declare His worthiness. They declare His power. They declare His right and authority and sovereignty to rule and to reign. They declare their agreement with Him about everything that He is about to do in the world. They They declare the fact that He made the world and all that is in the world. And it is His right to do with it as He pleases. There are no songs about evolution and glory. There's no evolution. God created it. And this is happening in the throne room in heaven. John is witnessing every bit of it. John sees, uh, he says, I, John, saw. It's the Greek word hedo. And it means that he literally saw it by his own eyes. Heaven will literally throb with the praises of God. Now anytime man enters the presence of God, Man always falls down in worship. Isaiah 6 and verse 5, Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 28, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 15. Man is terrified in the presence of God and always falls down in humble worship. Do you want to know what you're going to be doing in heaven? We will not be floating around a cloud and strumming a harp. Neither will we be fishing, hunting, or sleeping, or any of those foolish things we hear about from time to time. If you want to know what we're going to be doing in heaven, look no farther than this passage. When we leave here, we're going to be called up, we're going to be cleaned up, we're going to be called up, and in His praise and worship, we're going to be in our new bodies, our glorified bodies. When we arrive there, we will see what we were where we were headed, and what He's done for us in saving our souls. We will comprehend 
things that we would never be able to comprehend in our earthly dwelling and in our minds. Would to God it would become real down here. Oh, that we would praise Him for what we know already. There's nothing wrong with giving God praise. The only thing wrong with it is that we're, we're not doing it enough. We're not worshiping Him enough. Our praise should be volitional. That is, no one should force it. Our praise should be volitional. It should be visible, valuable, and vocal. Now, we should all get excited about heaven. Just today, I learned a, a cousin, another cousin, has gone off to glory. In the last month, between Melissa and myself, we've had several relatives go off into glory. There's a lot over there that I'm looking forward to see. My daddy went to be in heaven last May, this past May. I'm looking forward to seeing him. Looking forward to meeting people that I have never met before. How about you? I look forward to seeing the Lord. I look forward to joining my voices with the redeemed saints of God. And everything we do down here should be to give Him glory because He deserves it. But my friend, Revelation is a book that is not meant to confuse us, but to mesmerize us. And it does. And as we get into chapter 5, you're going to see the Lord Jesus take the title deed from the, of the earth from the throne room of God, from the very hand of God. And He is going to issue judgment on this earth. But my friend, we will not be here. This is a glorious picture of where we will be. Now I've covered this chapter as quickly as possible. Literally we could have at least three or four sessions on this. If we were more in an academic setting, we definitely would. There's so much here. But my friend, God is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our praise. Looking forward to chapter 5. I trust you'll have a great week in Him. God bless you. And I pray that uh, you'll have a great week in the Lord.